Speak Out Second Edition Intermediate Workbook by Antonia Clare, J.J. Wilson, and Stephanie Diamond Bayer. Published by Pearson. Copyright Pearson Education Limited, 2015. Unit 1 Identity Recording 1 1 When's the best time to learn a language? 2 Who was your first English teacher? 3 Where's the dictionary? 4 Why did people stop speaking Latin? 5 what did you learn last lesson? 6. What does your name mean? Unit 1. Recording 2. Maria. My mum and dad didn't speak any other languages at home, only German. But when I started school, they were really keen for me to learn English. My mother said it would give me a lot of job opportunities. Luckily, I think I had a natural talent and it's something I was interested in anyway, so I enjoyed my lessons. I think my mum encouraged me because she liked travelling so much. We used to visit different countries every year, mostly in Europe. But one year we went to Thailand... And I absolutely loved it. Everything was so different. It was a culture shock, but in a good way. That's probably why I became a translator, actually, because of my mum encouraging me to learn other languages and visit other countries. I'm pleased she did. I feel very lucky that I meet people from all around the world. Ahmed well, Lebanon is a beautiful country, and living in Beirut always felt very cosmopolitan. I mean, when you walk down the street, you hear Arabic, French, English, all sorts. A lot of the population there speak more than one language. I like that. It's a great experience, I think. You understand that the world is full of different people and different cultures. And it's pretty similar in the Netherlands too, I guess. When I moved there to work, I couldn't speak Dutch or Flemish. I mostly communicated in English to start with. To be honest, it didn't actually cause many problems, because people there are usually fluent in English. But I did some part-time Dutch lessons at college in the evenings, and by the end of the first year, I could get by. I hope I'm pretty fluent nowadays, but you'd have to ask my Dutch friends. Jessie I think in the UK we aren't brilliant at learning new languages, I think people would like to learn, but because English is so common everywhere, people don't always feel a pressure to speak other languages. And when Brits travel, they can generally use English, which is a shame because practice is so important with that kind of thing. I only learnt Japanese because I was living in Japan for a while. I worked for an international company and spent a couple of years in Tokyo. I didn't have lessons, I picked it up in my day-to-day -day life. To begin with, I could only use the basics, hello, how are you, that kind of thing, but I gradually built up my knowledge. I wasn't fluent when I left, but I had basic communication skills, and I could do most day-to-day -day things, shopping, arranging to meet people, everyday stuff. Unit 1. Recording 3. 1. He was an employee here. 2. I had a wonderful mentor. 3. All pupils wear a uniform. 4. We were teammates for years.
Five. Have you met my fiance? Six. Talk to your partner. Seven. She's my godmother. Eight. That club is for members only. Unit two. Tales. Recording one. One. Have you been here before? Yes, we visited Naples a few times. Two. Have you had time to see the museum yet? No, we haven't had time. Three. Did you find your hotel okay? Yes, we found the hotel without any problems. Four. Have you got your guidebook? Oh no, I've left it in my room. Five. Have you had any lunch? Yes, we've already eaten. Six. Have you enjoyed your stay? Yes, we've had a wonderful time. Unit two, recording two. One. Christine. A lot of friends were staying in my apartment. We'd had a party the night before, and in the morning, one friend, Danny, got up to make everyone some coffee. While he was making the coffee, he heard the news on the radio. He came back into the room and told us that John Lennon had died. Someone had shot John Lennon. We were all really shocked. It was a very strange feeling. We couldn't believe it. We'd all grown up with the music of John Lennon and the Beatles. We'd played his music the night before, and now suddenly he was dead. There was a huge feeling of loss. He was such a peaceful man who had wanted peace for everyone. It was a terrible way for him to die. Two. Rob. I was travelling to a meeting on the tube that morning, and there were delays everywhere. They closed the underground station. At first, I was really angry and worried about not getting to my meeting on time. But gradually, we started to realise that something terrible had happened. People outside the station were trying to talk on their mobile phones, but the networks were all down because of the panic. Some people started to get news, and soon we discovered there had been bombs all over London. It was a strange and terrible feeling. There were crowds of people outside shops watching the news on the televisions. Three. Gino. I was sitting in the kitchen of my house in Italy with my family, and I was only a child. Everyone was watching television. I remember the black and white pictures. I watched as this man landed on the moon. And I can remember thinking how amazing it must be to be an astronaut, and what an exciting job it was. Until then, I had wanted to be a train driver, but for a few years afterwards, I definitely wanted to be an astronaut. Four. Marianne. I was staying in Los Angeles with some friends, and I was only about eighteen years old. In the night, I suddenly woke up, and the whole house was shaking. I had never felt an earthquake before, but I knew that was what was happening. It was very frightening, but after a few seconds, it stopped. Everything went quiet, and I went back to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, I thought perhaps it had all been a dream. But when I went downstairs and turned on the radio, I heard the news. The quake was in San Francisco, and it had done a lot of damage. So I was lucky, really. But I will never forget that feeling. Review one, recording one. One. Who do you work for? Two. What type of things do you do? 
Three. What problems do you deal with? Four. When did you start working there? Five. Do you enjoy the job? Six. So why did you apply for this job? Review one. Recording two. One. I've stopped. Two. We made it. Three. He helped me. Four. They've killed it. Five. You've worked hard. Six. I thanked her. Unit three, future, recording one. Ruth, I'm going to backpack around Poland next month with my friend, so I've already started making plans. I'm afraid I have to organise things in massive detail, or I get worried. I do everything ahead of time. My friend says I plan too much, but that's just me. We're travelling by ferry and bus, and then doing a lot of walking, so it'll be reasonably cheap. We might stay in hotels if we can find some cheap ones, but we'll probably try and find youth hostels most of the time. I've booked our travel tickets, and now I'm making a list of the best hostels in the cities we're visiting. Actually, I really want to visit Lodz. It's the third biggest city in Poland, and there's a lot of unusual street art there on the walls of buildings. I'm a graphic designer, so I'm really interested in art. And these pictures are huge on the sides of buildings, so you see them as you wander around the city. I'm organising a route around the streets, so I see the best artwork. I think it's going to be fantastic. I'm going to take loads of photos too. Kieran. I'd like to think I'm well organised, meet deadlines, and so on. For example, I'm going to a sports tournament next week. I've been playing rugby for a long time, and this year we've made it to the final matches. So I've got started and written a list of things to pack, the sports kit I need, and where to meet the team bus, and so on. But the truth is, I'm good on paper, and then I procrastinate in real life. So I know that I'll put off packing until the last minute, despite my plans. I'm going to try and organise myself earlier, but if I'm honest, I'll probably end up doing it about an hour before I leave, even though the list has been ready for a week. And I'll probably get distracted and forget something really important, like my rugby boots. Amber, I've recently started work as a party planner. We arrange unusual or specialist events, the kind of thing people can't do easily themselves. In my own life, I don't plan that much, to be honest. I prefer to just let things happen without worrying too much. But at work, I'm pretty good at organising things and multitasking. My first big event is happening next week. It's an 18th birthday party for a boy who really likes scuba diving. So his parents asked us to organise his party at the beach and arrange for all the guests to dive. I even went and tried it out myself. I think it'll be quite an interesting party. We'll have a diving teacher to help people who want to try it. Drinks and then a barbecue and cake and so on. I hope it'll be successful, especially as it's my first party. I think planning comes naturally to me, and I love meeting new people. So this job suits me perfectly. Even when I was a child, I used to love organising things for other people. I used to drive my mum mad because I was so bossy. I try to keep it balanced. I don't plan much at all for myself. I just see what happens and go with that. 
Unit 3. Recording 2. 1. They're going to play squash. 2. I'm going to buy a new phone. 3. She's going to spend a week in Greece. 4. He isn't going to eat anything. 5. Are you going to walk to the station? 6. He's going to change his job. Unit 3. Recording 3. Conversation 1. Hello, I'm trying to find my lost luggage. Ah, OK. a y Uh, my bags went missing in Montevideo in Uruguay after a flight from Curitiba, Brazil. Can you say that again? Montevideo? I flew from Curitiba to Montevideo and my bags went missing. Have you reported it already? Yes, the name is Anders Kleberg. Hang on,、uh, could you repeat the last name? Anders. Kleberg. K L E E B U R G. Conversation 2. Okay, so cricket. So this is the bowler, okay? He runs up and bowls at the batsman. What exactly do you mean? What's a bowler? <laughs> a bowler is the person with the ball in his hand, okay? And he tries to get the batsman out, get him off the field. Do you mean to say he tries to kill the batsman with the ball? No. Conversation 3. Did you read this? About popcorn? In 1948, two American scientists found some popcorn in a cave in New Mexico and dated it. It was over 5,000 years old. I didn't catch any of that. Are you talking about popcorn? Yeah. It's an ancient food. Popcorn is thousands of years old. I don't get what you're saying. You mean the popcorn we ate in the cinema yesterday is thousands of years old? No, popcorn in general. People have eaten it for thousands of years. Unit 4 Jobs. Recording 1. 1. I work in a busy airport in France. I am responsible for a small group of people. In my job, you need to know what you are doing. You must be very accurate and observant. And you have to be able to work well under pressure and be a good decision maker. 2. I work in a pizza restaurant. In my job, you need to have a friendly, relaxed manner. It's important to be friendly to customers and patient. You have to be organized and have a good memory too. 3. In my job, you have to be a really good communicator. You need to be able to listen carefully to customers and find out what the problem is. And then you have to be able to think outside the box sometimes to see if you can find a solution to the problem which will keep everybody happy. You have to be able to stay calm even if the customer starts getting angry. 4. I work in a lawyer's office. You have to have good organizational skills, I think, and you shouldn't get stressed too easily. You have to be quite hard working as well, and you need to pay attention to detail. 5. I work in a children's hospital. I think the most important quality for my job is that you must be a caring person. You have to care about the people you're looking after. And you have to get on with children. <laughs> That's very important. Six. You need to be very patient in my job, especially when there's a lot of traffic. And you have to be a good timekeeper as well. You always have to be on time. Unit four. Recording two. 1. I used to be very sporty. 2. K 
Can I use your phone? Three. He never used to worry about it. Four. I used to live in the USA when I was 18. Five. This stuff is used to kill insects. Six. I don't use the car much anymore. Seven. We used to love going there on holiday. Eight. I didn't used to live in Europe. Review 2. Recording 1. Amazing. Successful. Delicious. Exhausted. Salary. Interview. Furious. Difficult. Tasty. Leader. Boiling. Freezing. Competitive. Impossible. Unit 5. Solutions. Recording 1. Mia. Well, it's changed a lot. Goodness, enormously. I mean, 30 years ago, I was still at school. I was 10 years old. Life was a lot simpler then. All I had to think about was doing my homework and enjoying my free time with friends. I think life was simpler for everybody then. We didn't have all this technology, and I think the pace of life was slower. At work, when someone sent a letter... It could take a week or two even before they would get a reply. Nowadays, people email and they expect an instant response. On the same day or within an hour or two. That puts a lot of pressure on people. We say that technology has saved us time, but it just speeds things up. And we're expected to do so much more. It's non-stop. We have mobile phones and Blackberries, iPhones... So we don't just turn off and relax. Tom. That's an interesting question. It's changed a lot. I live in Beijing, so there has been a huge advancement of technology and huge growth. There are more people with more money. There has been an economic explosion here, so the city has grown. All the offices and high-rise buildings, lots of those weren't here 30 years ago. And it's very multicultural nowadays. People from all over the world live in Beijing. People came from everywhere to see if they could get rich, and many of them did get rich. They made millions. I think in a lot of places out in the countryside, things haven't changed that much. Life is quite similar to how it was before for farmers and their families. I suppose they have more technology now. They have mobile phones and televisions and the internet, so they know a lot more about the wider world and what is going on. Thirty years ago, they just had a radio and it was difficult to find out information. That's much easier now. Owen Oh, well, both, probably. The world is getting better in many ways. I think if we look at living standards across the world, obviously there are still millions of people living in terrible poverty, but I think the situation is getting better. People have better access to food and medicines and education, so these are all things which are improving. Medicine is improving, so people live longer, and we can fight infectious diseases. People's lives have improved because of technology, so life is easier now than it was before. A lot of manual work is done by machines, but in some ways the world is getting worse. War, for example, is a bigger problem all the time. There are more and more wars, which is surprising, and weapons are becoming even more dangerous. I think the environment is definitely suffering so we are polluting more than we used to because of all the industrialisation. And I think also, socially, things are getting worse, because people are less social now than before. They spend more time on their own, with computers and computer games, and less time talking to others, working together. And I think that is a great shame, and a problem for the future too.
Unit Five, Recording Two. A, make. Space, communications, aeroplanes, vaccinations. A, apple. Antibiotics. Travel. Satellites. Vacuum. A. Polar. Nuclear. Machine. Commercial. Solar. Unit Five. Recording Three. One. Have you met Yinka's parents? Only once. They're doctors, aren't they? Two. There isn't a cloud in the sky. I know it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Three. Are you looking for the scissors? You haven't seen them, have you? Four. Have you read John Palahiri's new book? Yeah, she's a great writer, isn't she? Five. I've got my final exam tomorrow. You'll pass, won't you? Six. I think this is the wrong address. Yes, we've made a mistake, haven't we? Unit Five, Recording Four. One. Excuse me. Could you tell me the way to the swimming pool, please? Yes, of course I can. You keep going this way until you get to the traffic lights. Then you turn to the left. Two. Hello.、Uh, do you know what time the bank opens? I'm not sure. I'll just ask someone. Three. Do you want us to bring anything? That would be great. Could you bring some salad and maybe something for dessert? Yes, of course. Anything else? No, that'll be fine. Four. Could you help me with my bags? I'm sorry, I can't. I've got my hands full. Five. Would you mind opening the door for me? Of course not. There you are. Thank you. That's very kind. Six. Could you tell me what time the show starts? Let me have a look.、Uh, the afternoon show starts at three p.m. Thanks very much. Seven. Would you mind coming to get me from the station? Okay, sure. Wait outside, and I'll be there in ten minutes. Eight. Do you know if there's a post office near here? Yes, there is. There's one just along this road. Unit six. Emotion. Recording one. One. If I had more time, I'd learn to ski. Two. If you didn't work, what would you do? Three. If they had to move, they wouldn't live with me. Four. She'd go out at night if her parents let her. Five. Where would you go if you had the chance? Six. I wouldn't sleep if I drank that coffee. Unit six, recording two. 
In the eyes of street criminals, everybody communicates something. Some people communicate strength and power. Others communicate, I am a victim. Researchers Jean A. Hampton and Robert Ely asked convicted criminals to watch a secret video of a street scene and then say which people looked like possible victims of a crime. They did it easily. The potential victims, surprisingly, were not always small women. Sometimes they were big men. For this interview, Robert Ely looked at this picture of a street scene and explained which people were potential victims. Unit 6, Recording 3 So, which of these people would a criminal go for? Not the ones you think. Can you explain? Yeah. So, for example, you've got an old woman, see? Yes. So, you're a criminal, OK? You might think, OK, this old woman is small and weak. She's not going to fight me or give me any trouble. But who's she with? She's with a dog. That's right. And the thing about dogs is they are unpredictable. And the last thing you want if you're a criminal is unpredictability. You have about five seconds maximum to commit the crime and you don't want any surprises, OK? So you leave the old woman. Right. Is that really the length of time for a street crime? Five seconds? That's the maximum. Most street crimes take maybe two seconds, then it's over. Wow. OK, so let's take someone else. There's a woman talking into a mobile phone, OK? Yes, I see her. Easy victim or not? Well, if she's talking on a mobile phone, she could tell her friend what's happening, right? And then what? Um, the friend calls the police. And do you think the police are going to get there in five seconds? Well, no. No, this woman on the phone is a potential victim. The phone doesn't matter. The reason she's a potential victim is that she isn't paying attention to what's happening around her. She isn't looking at other people. She's distracted. I see. The same with the tourists looking at the map, OK? Right. They're concentrating on the map, not the people around them. This also tells the criminal that these people are lost and don't know what they're doing. But... There are two of them, right? So maybe a criminal would hesitate. Maybe, but don't forget, it takes half a second to steal something and run. OK, what about the man at the cash point? The guy taking cash out of the bank. What's he doing wrong? Well, if that was me, the cash would be in my wallet before I turned around. That's right. He's basically saying, look at me, I've just taken out lots of money and I'm too stupid to put it in my wallet quickly. He's a criminal's dream. Uh, what about the woman in a miniskirt? Well... She's attractive and, I don't know, she's not exactly big and strong either. Maybe a victim? But look at her body language. She's confident, she knows where she's going, she's looking straight ahead and she's probably moving fast. No criminal would go for her. That's interesting. So body language is pretty important. It's extremely important. Look at the man in the coat. Big man, probably strong, but what's his body telling us? He's not focusing. Yes, that's right. He's looking at his feet. He doesn't know who's around him. Any criminal will think, nice coat, probably a fat wallet in there, full of money, and he's not concentrating. The key for a street criminal is surprise. It doesn't matter who the victim is, if you can surprise them, they have no chance. The couple leaving the taxi? Rule number one of the street. If you have anything valuable, don't show it. This man's wearing an expensive watch, which everyone can see. The other thing is people leaving cars are always in a weak position. They aren't standing up properly, and they aren't aware of who else is on the street. Oh, gosh, if... you've really given me food. Unit 6, Recording 4, Conversation 1. Bad news, I'm afraid. What's the matter? I'm afraid it needs a new engine. Conversation 2. What's the problem? I'm sorry to have to tell you, but we lost the match. Conversation 3 I've got some good news for you. What's that? We've won a holiday for two in Turkey. <gasps> Conversation 4 I'm afraid I've got some bad news. What's happened? The flight's been cancelled. Conversation 5 There's something I've got to tell you. What's that? I've failed my exam. Conversation 6 You'll never guess what happened. What? I was promoted. Conversation 7 Unfortunately, we were burgled last night. 
Oh no, that's terrible. Conversation eight. I've got something to tell you. What is it? We're getting married. Unit seven. Success. Recording one. One. He's very gifted. She's really skillful. Two. He has an aptitude for sport. I'm hopeless at gymnastics. Three. He thinks he's useless. She has a talent. Four. They say he's an expert. She has great ability. Unit seven, recording two. Siddis was the greatest genius in history. William Siddis, a genius, probably the greatest mind of the twentieth century. They say his IQ was between two hundred and fifty and three hundred. That's off the scale. A genius. William Siddis, great brain, difficult life. Siddis, genius. Was William Siddis the most intelligent man who ever lived? If so, why isn't he famous? Why isn't his name known like the names of Einstein, Leonardo, and Charles Darwin? What can his life teach us? William James Siddis was born on April the first in eighteen ninety-eight. That's right, April the first, April Fool's Day. His parents were Boris and Sarah Siddis, Russian Jewish immigrants who had settled in New York. They were both passionately interested in education. Boris was a psychologist who taught at Harvard University, and Sarah used to read Greek myths to her son as bedtime stories. It soon became clear that their son was something special. Aged six months, William said his first word, "door." At seven months, he pointed at the moon and said, "moon." At eighteen months, William could read the New York Times. And aged three, he reached up to a typewriter and wrote a letter to a shop called Macy's, asking them to send him some toys. At six, he could speak Russian, French, German, and Hebrew. All of this took place at home, but soon he made newspaper headlines. He passed the entrance exam to one of the United States' best universities at the age of eight. Then, aged nine, he gave a lecture on mathematics at Harvard University. Attended by maths professors and graduate students, this lecture put Siddis on the map. He began attending Harvard University two years later. At the age of eleven, now that he was in the public eye, things began to go wrong for William Siddis. The media was fascinated by him. Journalists followed him around and wrote articles about this young genius. Not surprisingly, Siddis began to feel like an animal in a zoo, with everyone watching him. He wasn't interested in becoming famous, nor in becoming an academic. He just wanted to live a quiet, private life. He tried. He went from job to job, publishing only one book of any academic interest. But everywhere he went, whatever he did, people eventually learned who he was, and the press kept writing about him. In 1944, he died, aged 46, almost forgotten. Since his death, many stories have been told about Sidis. Some said that his genius burned out like an old light bulb. His sister said Siddis knew all the languages of the world, and that he could learn a language in a day. None of this was true. Even his IQ, which was supposed to be between two hundred and fifty and three hundred, was just a guess. No intelligence test has been invented to go to that level of genius. So, what can we learn from his life? Firstly, 
Not all childhood geniuses will produce great things as adults. They may think great thoughts or do incredible calculations, but many of them just do normal jobs and find happiness in that way. Secondly, Siddis spent much of his time and energy running away from fame. Unless they want to be Hollywood stars, people need to be left in peace. That's how most geniuses do great work. Unit 7. Recording 3. Conversation 1. We really need to stop this. In my view, it's getting out of control. For example, she watched TV for six hours yesterday. Six hours! I must say, that's a lot. It is a lot. She needs to get out more. And when she's not in front of the TV, she's on the internet. That's what I was saying. She's always in front of a screen. Conversation 2. For me, Elizabeth is the best. She would be really good in this job.、Mm, why do you think so? For one thing, she has the right qualifications. For another, she obviously really wants the job. Yeah, that's very clear.、Uh, I think the other woman.、Uh, Hayla. Hayla. She would do a good job too. She would. But having said that, she already has a good job. You can see that Elizabeth is really hungry for this position. Conversation 3. Mr. Dyson, in your presentation, you said that the arts in many schools weren't getting enough attention. Can you explain? Yes. The reason I say this is that funding has been cut for arts subjects. There just isn't enough money. Let me give you an example. A school I visited last month wanted to do a play in the little school theatre, but there was no money for costumes, for music. So, in the end, there was no school play, and the theatre was closed for the whole summer term. And this is a money issue? I do think we could solve a lot of the problems if the government recognised the arts as it recognises maths or science or reading. Yes. Like I said, money isn't everything, but it's part of the problem. Unit 8 Communities. Recording 1. Elise. I live next door to my parents who are on one side and my brother's family who are on the other side. Right. It's really, really useful. They're the perfect neighbours. In what sense? Well, I like the situation because we help each other. For example, if I need a babysitter for my kids, it's no problem. And you see each other a lot? We work together in the family business, so we see each other every day. And I guess the whole extended family, which is 11 of us, including the children, we eat together maybe once or twice a week, always on Sundays and sometimes during the week. So, yes, we do see each other a lot. You never get fed up with the family? No. I think this situation is quite normal in a lot of countries, maybe like Italy. It certainly is for our family. We've always lived in the same town. I've lived here all my life and we always wanted to live side by side. I hope our children continue the business and live here too. And what about your husband? Does he like being so close to your family? Um, I've never asked him actually. Yeah, of course he does, I think. Mark. We don't have any neighbours. Our nearest neighbours are a couple of cows that live in a field about <laughs> ten miles away. Are they good neighbours? Fantastic, very quiet. No, we really are completely isolated. So, how come? I mean, was this your dream? Well, it wasn't at first. We were living in Paris, which is a great city, but it's kind of big, and we got tired of crowds of people and all the noise and using public transport. So, about ten years ago, we bought an old farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. It's not a functioning farm, but it has an internet connection, and me and my wife both work online. And we just love the peace and quiet. So, the cows aren't yours? No, they belong to a farmer about ten miles away. And isn't it a bit lonely out here? We love it. We never see our neighbours, apart from the cows. Which is just fantastic for us as we're a bit antisocial. <laughs> Actually, you're the first person we've seen this year. Oh, sorry to interrupt your piece. <laughs> Not a problem. 
Just don't stay too long. <laughs> <laughs>
Once again, the ancient Greeks were the first in Europe over 2,000 years ago, although there was a similar system in Korea. Both of these civilizations had pipes and controlled fires under the floors to keep the buildings warm. In England, one of the first examples of central heating was in the 1830s. A rich banker installed it in his house so that he could grow grapes in England's cold weather. The final invention we're going to look at today is the good old umbrella. If we look at a number of ancient sculptures from Egypt and Persia, which is now called Iran, it's clear that the umbrella has been around for a long, long time, certainly more than 2,000 years. Interestingly, it seems that only kings or very important people had umbrellas in these sculptures. So they were a symbol of high social class. But what were they for? In Europe, we tend to think of umbrellas as things to protect us from the rain, but historically, they protected people from the sun. And later, they became a fashion item. Unit 9. Recording 3. 1. The Institute's given a million euros a year. 2. One day a cure for cancer will be discovered. 3. The files were stolen last year. 4. These photos were taken at the end of the war. 5. The missing people have been found. 6. The paintings are cleaned once a year. Unit 9. Recording 4. 1. Marissa had her baby yesterday. Did she? What wonderful news! Two. I'm doing an online project about Minecraft. Oh, really? That's interesting. Three. His cousin was an Olympic boxer. Was he? Wow! Four. My sister doesn't eat meat. Doesn't she? OK, I'll cook fish. Five. I think we need to go down this road here. That's right. I remember that cafe. Six. I love Lady Gaga. Do you? I think she's crazy. Seven. Did you know that dolphins have names for each other? That's interesting. Eight. My parents have never been here. Haven't they? When are they going to visit? Nine. Jake was the number one student in the country. Really? I didn't know that. 10. John's got the car. We'll have to travel by bus. Will we? Oh, that's annoying. 10. World. Recording 1. In 2007, one city decided to take a stand against climate change. 2.2 million people across Sydney switched off their lights for an event that would become known across the world as Earth Hour. Earth Hour quickly went global, spreading across the world, and in 2010, thousands of cities in 128 countries took part. Global landmarks like the Eiffel Tower in Paris, the Egyptian Pyramids, New York's Empire State Building and Sydney Harbour Bridge all plunged into darkness as millions of people around the world switched their lights off to protest against climate change. Organisers say that they want to demonstrate what people can do to reduce their carbon footprint and save energy, and thus draw attention to the problem of climate change. However, critics describe the event as meaningless. 
In today's programme, we're asking what you think. Can Earth Hour really make a difference? Is it a good way to raise awareness about the problems the world is facing? Have you taken part in the switch-off? First on the line, we have Amy. Amy, can you tell us what you think? I think Earth Hour is a great idea. It's a really simple way for people to show that they care about the environment and want something to change. So, did you do anything for Earth Hour last year, Amy? Yes, I did. I was at home with my two children, who are 8 and 13 years old, and we switched the lights off at home and had our dinner by candlelight. And how did you find that? What did the children think? It was brilliant. The children loved it, and we enjoyed a really quiet hour with no television or music. We talked, actually, and we'll be doing it again this year, definitely. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for calling. Now we've got JJ on the line. JJ, what do you think of Earth Hour? I think it's a complete waste of time. I can't believe it. Wow. And why is that, JJ? What's the problem? I don't understand how anybody can think that turning off your lights for one hour is really going to make any difference. It's just a way for people to do something which makes them feel better. They turn their lights off for an hour, and then they think they've done something about climate change, and then they can carry on as they were before. What we need is for people to really change how they behave every day, not just for an hour. They need to use less electricity, not drive around in their cars everywhere. We need governments to make big changes, and turning your lights off, well, it's just silly. But don't you think, JJ, that it is a symbol, a gesture, that helps to get people around the world thinking about the problems? Yes, you're right. But the main problem is not to get people thinking about it, but to get people to actually change the way that they live. And that's not easy. You're right about that, I suppose. But next on the line... Unit 10. Recording 2. 1. Gina refused to come with us. 2. He promised to call me later. 3. They decided to go out for a meal. 4. They agreed not to go on holiday this year. 5. She warned us that the restaurant was very expensive. 6. They invited James to go to the theatre with them on Friday. 7. The teacher explained that the children grow vegetables in the garden. 8. He recommended buying our fruit at the market. <laughs> 